introduction. My name is Curtis Velarde. I've been a, bit, a systems engineer for maybe uh, 10, 12 years now. Um, primary working with Kubernetes and an AWS, maybe the last five years in production. You know, Kubernetes isn't hard, but it is a lot. And this is where um, we're going to be talking about in the fireside chat with, you know, exactly how we're going to, uh, how CubeArmor approaches and solves these issues for SREs, for developers, and, you know, and integrate as a part of your SDLC. The, the primary reason why we started on Cube Armor or why we started working on security is that we found that there were really, really a dearth of tools which can do the actual enforcement part. There were a lot of primitives out there available uh, in, the, in the open world, but those were not really catered towards Kubernetes or containerized tools. We thought uh, if we have to handle MITRE TTPs the right way, we need the right mitigation points and we can't we can't we can't go about inventing new mitigation techniques like we, we try to see what are the mitigation techniques available out there in the linux world we found that there are lsms slnx app armor have been used for past couple of decades those are the right primitives to be used but are those really consumable are those primitives can a devsecops team or a development team actually take those primitives and use it in the context of their workloads especially in the context of kubernetes and containerized workloads where keeping in sync with the security posture with this application update it's, it's it's a real pain that's where that those are some of the pain points that we thought of initially and we thought that you know uh, these are some these are some of the things that we have to tackle head on. We didn't find any appropriate open source out there. That's that's how the, the Cube Armor as a project started. Yeah, and um, I, just to piggyback on it, like so, when we moved from the, going to the challenges that we faced while moving to containers, we when I first started in the industry, it was BSD jail. So we were doing mm -hmm. CH roots and containers, and then we moved to VMs, and, I, and that was kind of the, all the rage, and that had, you know, the parallel virtualization calls, really isolating the process. Now that we've moved back to containers, um, it is, it is, it is what, old, what is old is new. So mm -hmm. this process, there's a lot of container breakouts, Kubernetes by default isn't secure. We know the pod network is open. We know a lot of people just run as root. So if a shell gets popped, you have full access to everything. Um, right. There's a lot of great, great books, Ian Coldwater, and a lot of really good talks about um, just securing the defaults. But when you have securing these defaults, there is a lot to do, right? You have, as you mentioned, mandatory access control, SE Linux, App Armor, capability sets, you know, running rootless, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And this is not even getting into this SDL uh, supply chain part using, you know, scanning the images, scanning the packages, hosting everything, um, you know, internally, and then then deploying it. So this really slows down one of the advantages of Kubernetes, which is a desktop a developer can take his laptop and ship it into production. Now with mm -hmm. a lot of uh, SRE teams, uh, we take our shells for granted. We don't do too much, you know, legacy Linux stuff, a lot of, you know, better developers, but there is a whole, like you said, um, like a whole system to learn to. So a developer ships me the app, um, how do I configure the capability? Make sure I only give it its necessary capabilities. How do I make sure that um, SE Linux app armor is configured if it gets popped? So the process is actually isolated. Now, these aren't, it's not very hard, but it's a lot. I find myself securing these systems. I'm on plural site half the day, going back to tutorials, and, I'm, and it's taking time. The productionizing in a real secure environment, which is coming down the pipe. We need compliance. We need um, just to show that we're trying is a big deal. You know, if we ever get yeah. compromised, which we all will one day, if someone really wants to, we need to make sure we can show everybody, um, you know, and be very transparent. Look, mm -hmm. this we, we're doing our best. We hit CIS compliance one. We, we're running mandatory access controls. This, this is run, not running as root. We have an admission controller. And this is where I find cube armor comes into play when it, uh, we can get more into this, when it runs its D and it has a listening mode where it can actually drop you know, SE Linux policies, app armor policies, and network security policies to block, um, you right. know, to actually isolate the process. And, you know, that's, you know, that saves so much time and it makes it more consumable for SRE and, and uh, sec, sec DevOps teams, because not everybody's going to have this information on hand. And, you know, that's kind of the primary challenge I see and where Cube Armor really fits in with some of the other tools. And it really does like armor your containerized process or assist in it. Indeed. So that's that's uh, that's that's has been our vision, and one of the points that you brought up is that today with the containerized workloads, in most cases, your workloads or the containers are direct gateway to an attack. 
like uh, your host is going to get compromised if there is a container escapable. Uh, one of the things that I have seen is in most of the managed cloud provider space, managed cloud providers are trying to protect the hosts, which means that, uh, for example, you have uh, hardened operating systems or distributions such as GK Eco Container Optimized OS or EKS Bottle Rocket. These are great, uh, great distributions. One should always, if, if anyone is serious about security, one should be using these kind of distributions. But then they, they are primarily protecting the host. What and in most cases, what we have seen is the external users are first hitting the ingress controller and then getting a direct access into your pods, which means that if there is an exploit available within your pod, the attacker is going to directly write, uh, reach into your pod and sit there and then start moving uh, laterally. Uh, so, so securing the pod is is one of the important aspects uh, you can't simply say that you know my host i have a hardened host system so i do not care about pod most of your customer data uh, volume mount points uh, kubernetes secrets kubernetes service account token all these are part all this is mounted right within the pod so if an attacker manages to get inside the pod they have almost uh, unrestricted access to everything unless you do something about and that's where you know uh, our, our intention with Kubernetes is. Yeah. Yeah, and I like to take into account that we should all change. Like we're going to be exploited at some point. So that's right. where it's just like, and, and if we, and a good point, like I said, VMs gave us that process isolation, but they were slow. Now we have um, containers and mm -hmm. Kubernetes, which are faster. But learning all those processes uh, or all the technologies to isolate is now, mm -hmm. especially in production engineering job, is slowing down development. Even you know even more at times, especially if we're in a compliance or um, an actual secure environment. You can't just you know, spin up an EKS cluster, have a security group so only the EOB can talk to it and then just be like, oh, it's on a secure subnet, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. it, you know, internally, it's all insecure, right? And then, yeah, right. you just run EMV when you pop a shell and go to town, if, you know, with, with the defaults. So uh, let's do one thing, you know, uh, let's let's jump into the internal architecture of Kubernetes, shall we? In most, some of the architectural elements you might see here are, are similar to what most of the other engines are making use of for, for, for the observability perspective. And the well, one good point that you brought up, uh, Curtis, before was Kubama not only just gives you an ability to observe something and then enforce the policies, but based on this observed, observed data, we have an ability to auto-generate a set of security policies which are then enforceable, which means that you get tailor-made policies in the context of your workloads. Uh, a typical example, uh, maybe I can, if I can quote, uh, you have Apache that is deployed in two different uh, deployments. The, uh, the Apache might get used in two different ways, which means that your security portion is different in each of these deployments. So how do you identify that? You know, it's, it's impossible to do that manually. I, you, you might do it manually once, but your application is going to be updated in, in, in two weeks time from now or a week's time from now, and then uh, it's no more going to be relevant. Uh, so, so you need some, some automated structure. That's where you know, uh, some of the architectural elements, you, you see eBPF here. Uh, primary job of eBPF here is to let the kernel events with the Kubernetes metadata. So if there is an event, let's say a process is formed as part of a container within a particular pod, particular namespace, we get that event at the kernel level, but that kernel, the kernel event has uh, very raw information. You get PID, uh, mount namespace, and uh, internal internal uh, kernel related context. Right? Kernel really really doesn't understand Kubernetes. So the one of the task here is to net that metadata with the Kubernetes metadata, the kernel metadata with the Kubernetes metadata, and give out the events. Of this events, these are the set of events which are then churned by something called as discovery engine. That discovery engine in turn generates a set of policies and those policies are then enforceable using the Linux security modules, app armor, SC Linux. And then there is a new, new LSM on the, on the horizon uh, called as BPF LSM. And I totally agree. And just to summarize again, um... That eBPF listening mode, yeah, you just get the syscall, right? The syscall and some of the metadata and the syscalls are, yeah. are the attacks, right? So generating rule uh, and like, uh, having these, these rules that are generated can be put into version controlled. Um, they're deployed by 
you know, a daemon set, but you know, it could actually just be, you could use the listening mode, which I was messing around with just, and take those, take those rules and deploy them with Ansible. You know, it, it, whatever your deployment scenario is, that's kind of the big, the big get without destroying right. the application, having to dig in, just having to dig in and, you know, you really have to know your syscalls, especially with, you know, eBPF, uh, LSM, that's going to, I definitely take over, but again, it's a new technology that we're going to have to learn, which, mm. you know, the cube armor actually takes some of that off our plate and gives us a good starting point. Correct, correct. I mean, you, you get great flexibility with BPF LSM, but unlike App Armor and SLNS, there is no predefined policy language. You have to actually write eBPF bytecode. People were oh. already facing difficulties writing SLNS policies because it was complex. Imagine them writing eBPF bytecode to protect something. So that's not going to happen, right? You know, we, we, we all know that uh, you know, no, one is, no, no security administrator is going to write the eBPF bytecode. Uh, so you need a solution which can abstract away all this complexity. And essentially, uh, that's what Kubawa does. And the other challenge that we have seen is, when you have a big cluster, it can actually support multiple types of LSMs under the hood. Like, you know, there might be in a, in a 50 node cluster, you might have 10 nodes supporting app armor, 10 nodes supporting BPF LSMs, and 10 nodes supporting, I mean, others, others supporting SNMs. How are you going to deal with this situation? You know. Uh, uh, it's it's impossible for any sane uh, security administrator to come up with. I mean, unless and until yeah, how many really people understand. are we going to have to hire to run this? Right? <laughs> you know, exactly. How many domain experts do are necessary to run this one cluster? And then right. are we? You know, then we're kind of moving back. Are we defeating? You know, the whole purpose of running Kubernetes and you know working in containers, right? Uh, most of the other toolings, the way in which they operate is they find out the malicious intent. Like this particular unknown process is invoked. Now you go and kill that unknown person. But by the time you kill that unknown process, the damage might have been already done. With LSMs, you get inline remediation. And that I feel is, is one of the key capabilities of LSMs that have been utilized in the context of virtual machines and bare metal, but not so much in the Kubernetes and containerized rootwords because obviously it was, it was very difficult to use, but it changes everything. The moment you give attacker the ability to execute their code, you lose, you know, uh, you are at the mercy of how dumb the attacker is. And so you should not be giving an opportunity to execute unknown code within your workloads. And that's essentially what we are trying to do here with this. And I, and I like to take the approach that it wasn't so like you said, script kitty got in, it was, you know, supply chain attack, everything else is secured during your SDLC. You just pulled something in that was signed and bang, they popped a shell on your system. Is yeah. it, you know, how many permissions, how locked down is that? And we just all have to prepare for that. And I, this is where I agree. You have LSMs. It's a known technology that protects against this. You know, it uh, comes from the NSA, all this jazz. And, you know, that's why I'm so impressed with Cube Armor because it's like, no, this is exactly the point to lock it down. And it works in conjunction with other tools. Yes, you have your, you know, Falcos um, that are, you know, alerting when that with their whitelist, when, you know, the wrong, EX, the wrong syscall is called or the wrong, you know, we're trying to pull an image. You have your emission controllers that are making sure, you know, locking down certain things from the API angle, but there's that huge in between where it's just kind of like, okay, they got past that mm -hmm. um, and they got hit. Now you've been alerted, but everything's automated. You know, these guys are good. Everyone's getting better. They're understanding the attack surface. We just can't assume um, an, intru an intruder is going to suck nowadays, right? With all <laughs> exactly. with all, yeah, with all <laughs> the uh, APTs going on, it's just crazy, right? These guys are good, guys and girls. Uh, there's one more point I would like to talk about is, is, is network segmentation. And this is the traditional way of doing network segmentation was, you know, either you insert an IP table rules and redirect the TCP packets. And then based on those TCP packets, you can identify the, the connectivity. So inserting an IP table rules has a performance impact. You have to insert the rule at the host level. With Cubarmer, essentially, now we have visibility into the pods and continuous. So with pods and containers, we exactly know what connects and accepts and binds have been done within the container. And based on that information, the discovery engine churns out and sees that, oh, this connect is this pod is trying to connect to this other pod, or this pod is trying to connect to this other service and generate Kubernetes rules based on that. And these Kubernetes network policies are enforceable using any of the CMI. So you get network segmentation with least performance impact so you can use Cube Armor to actually get the visibility, create the network policies, and then say, give give the policy enforcement back to the. Uh, 
Yeah, we mentioned that you, you said that the pod network is default open, the old workflow of trying to get, you know, that, that I, I'm, I'm actually guilty of doing this. And there's a front, let's just say a front end and a back end namespace. I, these are pretty complicated containers, which happen, you know, a lot of people ship VMs as containers. It just is what it is. But trying to, you know, sort it out, you just match label on back end and allow all, yeah, you have your default deny. But, you know, the, the rules are very, very wide open. Now, there are tools that you can in plugins to put it in listening mode, but you still kind of have to troubleshoot it. And again, slowing down the development process, um, up the cognitive load on your developers, on your SRE teams. And when something breaks, you might not know how and or, or where to open. And that's where, you know, security starts to fall apart, right? I just exactly. okay, open everything from one from one namespace to another and we'll call today and we'll get to it later, which never <laughs> happens. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So, so uh, we have been talking about a lot of things. Let's get to the terminal and let's see how it operates in, in, in practice, right? So, so let, let me just pop open the, the sample terminal here. I have a sample uh, Kubernetes cluster here. Essentially, uh, you see QArmor is a daemon set that's been deployed already here. Uh, now, I do not have any security policies applied as of now. KSP stands for, stands for Kubernetes security policies. But before going into the security policies, uh, let's see what kind of application behavior you'd be able to see with QBarmer. So it's not only about policy enforcement, right? As a user, I would like to first understand what my application is doing. And based on that, I might want to take some certain decisions. So let me, uh, I have an application here, uh, a test application called as damn vulnerable web application. Uh, it, it's a vulnerable application by, you know, so, so I'm making use of it to explain how, how one can make use of Kubama to get the information. So you can specify that I want summarized information of what is happening within this namespace in an aggregated. So once you do this, uh, so yeah, you see in MySQL pod, uh, you see all the processes that are getting executed. These are the different processes and this is the parent process which is executing the count, the last updated and all of those processes were allowed execution. Similarly, all these processes were accessing which all file system data. Uh, so you get all that information. Not only that, you get ingress connections. Now this is, a, this is where it gets interesting. You see ingress connection being made to MySQL pod and who is making the ingress connection? It's a DBWA web application that is making connection on port. So now you not only get the information as to which pod is connecting to which other pod, but within that pod, which is the process which is accepting that connection is the detail, is the information that you get. So it doesn't stop from, you don't get a simple information that an egress connection is happening, but an egress connection is happening to this other pod and this particular process within that pod is handling that particular connection. So that kind of, that level of details you see. Uh, and, and what are the number of connections? Similarly, on the egress side, egress side here, it's only using uh, Unix domain sockets. MySQL is not supposed to make any egress connections. So this is correct. It, there's only Unix domain sockets that have been made use of my, 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 my uh, So this is great. Uh, so uh, similarly for, so this, this information is for the web application. So in the web application, as you can see, these are the set of processes that are executing. Apache is the primary process which is executing. And within that Apache, there's ping and several other processes that are executing. And these are the set of uh, uh, file accesses that are made. And you can see here on the egress side, right? You can see that it's making an egress connection to DVWA MySQL service application. So Apache 2 as a process, as a binary, is making an outbound access to this particular service on port 3300. Now, based on this information, what do you get? So, so this is this is observability information, right? So, our intention is to lock down the workload. Now, how do you lock down the workload? If you do a KRMR discover, and again, uh, so I'm I'm doing a discover. What I'm asking is, discover me the security posture for namespace DVWA in YAML format for these particular set of labels. So, these labels are for the web application. The moment you do this, it explains, it shows you all the different processes that are executing and all the different file system accesses that are made. Similarly, if you if you want to see the network policies, uh, you should be able to use network. And then well, you you see you see the network policies that are auto-generated for you. You, you. As a user, 
as a security administrator, you didn't have to manually go and check what's happening. What it says is allow ingress connection. Let's let's parse what this particular policy says. Uh, it says on the ingress side, allow only pod DVWA to connect on 3306 to my three. We have not seen as of now anything else apart from DVWA web to connect to my seat. So once you have this, you get the least permissive security posture for your group. So on both the network side, from the application side, only these set of processes are allowed to execute, only these set of file system accesses are allowed to be made, only these network connections are allowed to be made, only from those ports. So you have a least permissive for your policy setting. So not only do you get network segmentation, but systems segmentation uh, happening internally as well. well. Yeah, and it's amazing. And to me, it just getting this starting point is so critical. There, and we're coming into workflows, there's going to be, I see a new environment before you hit UAT or staging, you, you have an environment because as you can see, they're from the command line. So this can all be scripted. So from your CIC, whatever your pipeline you want to use, you can run you know, these commands and you know, um, and I'm a big fan of double coverage. So the first uh, listing of all the syscalls that have made, you know, all the binaries that are being libraries that are being loaded, those can be um, then taken for your security admin and load into say another you know, double coverage tool, Falco trace, whatever you want to do. But this gives you a starting point instead of these huge massive massive rules you have to write. We know exactly what we need to secure and we know exactly. if anything else is called, that's out of bounds, right? We need to know, like, it, not only will these, will come to see be blocked, they also need to be alerted on. So we know, you know, something, something wrong happened. And then, you know, for testing, not everything's going to work, you know, smoothly. There's always going to be an issue. That's why, you know, use this for another environment. And with the date, you'll, you'll, we'll go through it, install these LSM, install these network policies, and then deploy it into the UAT environment and run your test there to make sure right. that, you know, the regressions and applications. And that's where I'm really impressed by, you know, just that, you know, you know, it's solving so much work, which is, you know, eBPF is amazing, which is su such um, minimal, you know, cognitive load again on me. I'm like, okay, I have a starting point instead of, all right, here's an app. What do I do with it? Right. So we, we saw that we can generate this policy. Now I can actually get this policy and then apply it uh, you know so so before applying the policy let me show you uh, the sample uh, the dvw application is live right now so oh, nice. port, port 8081. so i have a command injection attack possible here which says that you know uh, i should be able to do cat or you know i i should be able to execute host local host right uh, and this goes and pings things, right? As simple as that. Now, uh, I, I, I have auto-generated the policies. What, what I'm going to show additionally is, let's say I want to, so this has a command injection attack, which means that if I want to uh, open up a file as part of this, yeah, you see here, I'm, I, I'm now able to see the contents of the shadow file directly through, through this command. Now, if I have, when, it comes, um, when it comes to the NSP, sorry, um, what's a good one is if you do a wide check one of the other pods and you'll be able like just to demonstrate how open it is, you'll be able to run this pin command and hit any other pod correct. that or that it's in the work. Uh, so that not only is it letting you, we have two issues here, right? Full open access and we're able to read files that we shouldn't be reading. Right. Exactly, exactly. So, so now uh, that we have auto discovered the policy here, which says that, no, you see web.yaml, uh, it says, these are the only set of processes to be allowed. Okay, now if I apply the policy. Apply that bad boy. <laughs> yeah. So now this policy is applied. We should be able to see. And the best part is we are using Kubernetes native constructs. So it, it gets deployed as a CR. So the Kubernetes Cube Armor security policy is a CRD. It's a Kubernetes resource, which is orchestrated by Kubernetes. So it has all the advantages of, you know, you, you, you can add, delete rules, policies, you can edit a CRD, you can change the policies at runtime. So, so all, all those advantages. So now that we have this, yeah. As a store in version control, you know, everything we need. Store right? in version controls, exactly, exactly. So, so you, you have all the advantages of, uh, of uh, so now you see, even though I had specified the head command, uh, the the output of shadow was not listed because essentially it was uh, the, the the permission was denied for the head command because we have not seen that before executing before any time so I'm just redirecting it to the output so as as you can see here the head was permission denied.
the moment i like armor policy doesn't it <laughs> yeah yeah internally it's app armor which is actually blocking the uh, rule you know all the hard work we, we we stand on the shoulders of giant you know most of the hard work has been done for the past 20 years which we are really utilizing here yes yes agreed uh, uh, so so let me just delete this policy and now essentially we should be able to uh, see the content again uh, So what we, what I'm trying to show here is that inline remediation, even before the the the, the, the binder is executed, uh, you you are, you have the capability to stop it. You know, a simple attack such as command injection. Now, now a lot of times customers tell us that command injection is something that should be stopped by OAPs, you know, or or at, at the proxy level. But what what if you have if you have supply chain attack where the attacker is waiting for an opportune moment to strike? How would you rectify it? The attacker is not going to necessarily come through the front gate, right? Uh, uh, there are multiple avenues for attacker to come inside uh, inside your inside your pod. So uh, you have to protect at the fundamental level, and the only way to protect it at the fundamental level is using technologies such as these. Yeah, and they also uh, could have come in just through the host, another way in, and just you know, and just you know, ladder exactly. into yes. your container process. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. So there are multiple ways, right? And uh, right now we have been looking at the command line, but the same same information is also now. Uh, you know, let me just quickly talk about Akinox. Uh, so a lot of lot of users are wary of you know, using command line tools. So uh, the best part is we are not dependent upon any cloud provider specific APIs. Uh, we support uh, Google, AKS, EKS, and Kubernetes supports almost anything, including on-prem clusters. Manage provider clusters. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is onboard the cluster, and the moment you onboard the cluster, it starts showing up here, uh, and you know you you start getting uh, you know you you should start seeing the policies. Uh, you you start seeing the Kubernetes network policies. You should, you should start seeing uh, the system policies. So all the policies are auto discovered for you. Uh, this is the place. Uh, where one of the challenges that we have seen is, and we, we realized this early on, is that it's one thing to have a very flexible policy enforcement engine, but that policy enforcement engine at the end of the day needs a set of rules. Uh, how easy would it be possible to provide the users with the right set of rules is everything, you know, because the application is going to be updated. You're uh, you, not necessarily the application, the ecosystem around your application is going to be updated. The dependencies are going to be updated. Application developers won't be able to keep track of it unless and until you have some automated view. So essentially, with the this this is what provides you with with a way. Here you can now get these kind of policies automatically generated. And essentially, under the hood, it's all YAML, right? Uh, but but we are making things simpler by we have splunk application for qbomber specifically this is a cool uh you know splunk dashboard that you can you can have it shows you what 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 are the block events what are the audit events what events were uh in the in the context of mitre ttp is NIST, NIST and 800 and pci and pcdss and all those uh, all those things. and i love the, uh, yeah the yeah. um compliance you know categorization because that's that uh, compliance in kubernetes is very difficult and that's another you know another thing how do you prove that we're actually doing what we say we're going to do and this is a great right. dashboard and, and another tie-in is with cube armor like it, it, it hits that good spot in between right most security right. engineers do know splunk but not all of us know you know lsms network policies and most of us don't have to and we and most developers in reality we're not going to have an sre or a devops guy embedded in every team it just you know we're shooting right. for that but it just is what it is. Well, in conclusion, it's a great tool to add to your existing capability or tool sets. Now, every tool that you learn has a cognitive load that everyone's got to learn. And, you know, it's just, it, you know, it's a part of your SDL. You have your tools for your SDLC. You can use, you know, you know Sneak, uh, Docker, Trivi, whatever, to scan your YAMLs, to scan, um, you know, make sure the, po the, the pods don't have any known, you know, issues or binaries installed. But when it comes to actually, you know, um, activating rules for the runtime, that's where that, you know, your Falcos and your, and your trace come in, but how difficult it is to write those rules. It's, it's fairly difficult. QArmor not only has writes them for you and gives you an enforceable policy agent that also alerts it, you know, it gives, like, again, it gives you that starting point and that's, you know, 
to me, that's everything. Now I can, it's, it's easier to go and teach Q cube armor than it is to learn SE Linux, learn app armor, learn capabilities. Uh, what's a, what's a network security policy. Okay. Now get it right. And you have two hours, like <laughs> yikes, right? This is where uh, Q, but with cube armor, it's actually doable. We just saw it. And it's very easy to demonstrate value. Like, look, now this is blocked. Uh, and you know that alert goes to wherever you need it to go, and you know we're alerting, right? Yeah, that's you know it's definitely worth you know time to learn. You know, there's so many tools out there. Um, not everyone, you know, not it's not one size fits all. But learning Cube Armor just gives you the ability to really lock down your process, kind of like you know old school VMs, right? You have the parallel virtualization call, and we get to see eBPF is amazing. We get to see exactly what's run. And, you know, listening mode is amazing. And then just start writing our rules. And also as a teaching tool, like I want to use it as a, like, yeah. to, if I'm going to be teaching people, if you're interested in app armor and SE Linux rules, like I am, I actually mm -hmm. like, okay, did I get this rule right? Run it in mm -hmm. listening mode. Oh, shoot, I messed up. Or writing, mm -hmm. you know, a Falco rule. Did I get this rule? Oh, no, I, you know, I, it's, it's all whitelist that you're writing. How are you generating these rules? And yeah. that's a, a big thing. Now it helps me learn what I should know because what's old is new, right? And thank you very much. Thanks for yeah. letting me just play around with the system. It's, you know, great. I love it.